come down, come forward. Come forward. Come join us down here. Hi, Safia. Everybody smile at Safia. <laughs> come down. I know, it's really uncomfortable. Yeah. Kill the heat. If you can't handle the heat, go to the kitchen. We can get started? Okay, I mean, if you don't mind coming down, this room is so big, actually, and I, I was hoping, I mean, honestly, I wasn't sure how many people are going to be interested in early stage direct deal investing. Um, it's, it's a lot of people, it's just kind of a gigantic room, so insofar as you can come down here, I'd love to make this as interactive and um, have you guys engaged in the conversation as much as possible, so come join us. Um, so we're going to let people trickle in. Um, my name is Julia Z. I am with Arabella Advisors. We are a philanthropic consulting firm, um, and we have the privilege of working with foundations and philanthropists to build out their mission using advocacy, philanthropy, as well as investing. Um, the reason I was interested in putting this panel together with my rock star speakers is because um, I feel like there's increasing interest in sort of direct engagement, high impact, really catalytic direct investment, um, feeling the sort of uh, output of what it is that you're trying to invest in. But it's very, very difficult to do. The intermediaries that are out there, they don't have the sort of skills or the ability to do. A lot of the wealth advisors, it's just, it's too difficult. They don't have the skill set. And so I thought it would be really, really interesting to bring together people who are, as my friend Andy Lower likes to say, getting shit done, um, to talk about sort of Oh, I'm sorry. Was there no potty language Strong here? Strong language. <laughs> um, Stuff done. So um, to, to sort of to, to have them talk about their process, how they've gotten things done, what's been helpful, what has been a hindrance. And so um, I'm going to tuck right into it. I'm not going into extensive biographies because I just did a panel and the hour flew by in like 15 seconds. So I don't want to waste time doing that. I want to really dig into it. Every single one of them has an incredible bio online. They're fabulous. Check them out. So um, let me start with Andy Lower, who's directly to my... Sit up, Andy. Jeez, sit up. Um, <laughs> So, Suitably reprimanded. Sit up and cut your hair. Um, so, Go with the floor. So Andy Lower was formerly the executive director of the Elios Foundation and really took kind of a bold and transformative way for a foundation to do really early stage direct investing. They syndicated, they brought together a lot of interesting co-investors. He left that organization and started ADAP Capital. He's doing some phenomenal work in the space. And so I have him here as a representative of somebody who's managed a foundation, managed an investment fund, to talk about the way that you've gotten things done. I'd love you to talk about your four-hour due diligence thesis um, and give some examples of what's worked, what hasn't worked. Great. Go. Great. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, and thank you all for, for joining us. So, basically, ADAP's two separate legal entities. There's ADAP Capital, which is a small, small fund. Um, we've done 11 deals in 15 months. Um, and then there's an advisory services organization, which is a fee-based advisory group, and that works with early-stage entrepreneurs. And then the third thing that I'm involved in is I've co-founded and co-owned a fair trade certified factory in India that we're looking to have as a visible open source social enterprise that we can be learning from. So um, I am all, fo all about getting stuff done. Um, one of the things that we've developed with ADAP is a different approach to poverty. That's what ADAP stands for. And we are trying to really get back to what Jed was saying earlier about the why of what we're doing and how we're trying to actually get more stuff done. So we do focus on a four hour due diligence process. Um, that's four hours of the entrepreneur's time and hopefully we can do it quicker than that. Um, if it takes more than four hours for us to make the decision, then there's a problem. Um, and then our main focus after we've made the investment, really investing in the entrepreneur that we've backed, um, changing the power dynamics, working around a round table with the entrepreneur, I get the majority of the investees uh, to come and stay at my home, uh, and they come with me and go to Juarez for Taco Tuesday. Um, and we get to know each other on a deeper personal level, established trust, and then we can also hopefully secure the investment by working more collaboratively. So we are very much focused on how we can move things quickly, but I think it is actually more effective. I've been called very interesting names because of that approach, um, told I'm reckless, told I'm irresponsible. But I actually think um, that it is more effective, um, both for the entrepreneur, but also for us as investors. Hmm. Thank you so much. OK, so we're going to come back to that. There's more to dig into here. But let me just go down the line here. Ron Bohm, who um, your particular role here on the, found, um, on the panel is to actually speak as an individual investor. Ron and his wife have been very, very actively engaged in investing in social enterprises and done a really high engagement model, I think, really connecting with your entrepreneurs and digging into the space. So I'd love for you to talk about that for those in the audience who um, are individual investors and are thinking about ways to get more deeply engaged. OK. Um... I'd say that uh, my wife and I, uh, and we have one part-timer that works with us, 
and we also subscribe to the rapid due diligence approach. But the, um, for us, a lot of it is that we have spent 30, 40 years in business, love working with entrepreneurs, and in fact, sort of backed into the finance side because so many of them, uh, we started talking about how they were going to get their capital, and we ended up making small loans. We were already sitting down with them, working with them, and gradually uh, often ended up making several investments in them. But uh, the engagement with the, with the entrepreneur is what we really enjoy. Uh, we don't think it's about the money. We think it's about the impact. We think it's about the relationship that we have with them. And like, uh, as, as Andy does, we have a lot of people come through the house. And um, sort of something that, uh, that my dad started years ago. And uh, it's just a great way to meet people from all over the world who are absolutely passionate about what they're doing and helping them accomplish what they set out to do is just uh, very fulfilling. So now that the room is filled up a little bit, and before we move on to you, Tasha, I'm sorry to sort of break up the flow, but I was hoping to get sort of just by a show of hands who we have in the room, because really this, um, hi, Jody, <laughs> these panels are designed for you, and so I'd really love to know like who is in the room in terms of like what is your interest, and we're going to open this up to q and I hope we have a really, really robust um, and lively Q&A and, and back and forth. So just by a show of hands, how many of you here are um, asset owners, so investors, people looking for ways to make investments in early stage social enterprises? Wow, awesome. Fantastic. Lots of you. Thank you. How many of you are social enterprises or social entrepreneurs and you're trying to figure out ways to raise capital? Okay, almost, almost an equal set. Um, how many of you here are sort of intermediary sort of financial advisors trying to figure out, oh, look, we've got a nice mix here in the room. Good group. Dream team. Kind, kind of, sort of. Um, do we have people who are in government, for example, who are, you know, OPIC? Oh, we got a few of you. Um, academics, people who are working in academia who are trying to figure out, oh, God, I love it. This is fantastic. Students, do we have students who are trying to figure out this space? Oh, no young people. We didn't attract young people into this. All right, that's all right. That's all right. Okay, so um, make sure you have questions for us because we want to have a really lively um, discussion when we sort of finish some initial questions here. Okay, so next to Ron, we have Tasha Seitz. Um, who is partner and CIO of Impact Engine, which is based in Chicago. They have an early stage investment fund. She comes from a long history of venture capital investing on the tech, something complicated. I can't even remember from your bio, Tasha. Um, but uh, the, the reason I wanted Tasha to speak today is because she is working with a number of people who want to make impact investments and have invested in their fund. And I was also interested if you could just kind of touch on why you, you, you kind of started in traditional venture capital and you moved into opening this fund. If you could just talk a little bit about the, the get stuff done from your perspective. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, just from a personal journey perspective, uh, I had been in venture capital. I've been doing it for almost two decades now. Um, and uh, one of the first companies that we invested in was one of the, it was the first company to put an internet browser on a mobile phone, which is a huge platform for creating impact in the world. And so when I discovered you could actually do that, I was absolutely um, sort of captivated by the concept. Um, got involved in launching Impact Engine as an accelerator, um, working with entrepreneurs, helping them get ready to raise money from investors. And our sort of hallmark is that we take a network-based approach um, to, uh, to working with entrepreneurs and working with investors. And one of the observations that we had was, you know, here are a bunch of entrepreneurs who, um, you know, are trying to raise money from angel investors, and it's really hard and time-consuming, and it's hard to get them sort of off the dime. At the same time, we had investors that we were showing companies to who were very interested but didn't have the background in how to make investment judgments and decisions, which is why we decided to start, decided to start the fund um, as a way to really do the work and the due diligence um, and have this sort of more professional engagement, um, sometimes over tacos, uh, sometimes we choose something else. No one's come to my house because it's been sure. under renovation for three years. But, um, but to have a professional engagement with the entrepreneur and then offer our due diligence and our judgment and um, co-investment opportunities to the investors in our fund uh, to make it more accessible and help them get up the learning curve. So that's, that's a little bit of all, our hallmark um, with early stage impact investing. Well, and speaking about networks, Bonnie, mm -hmm. Bonnie Mullenbrock, who is the executive director of Investor Circle. I don't know if any of you, did anybody attend their Beyond the Pitch day yesterday? By the way, can I just mention, I didn't attend it, but Bonnie told me this morning that nine of the 13 enterprises were women-led businesses, which is really, really, yep. really unusual. And it wasn't being solved for any kind of gender or women thing, which I was super, super happy to hear. So I, I'm sorry. I'm going down a different path here. <laughs> They're the most effective. <laughs> um, so, 
Was that me? I, I didn't move. Did I do something? Sorry. Is everyone okay. still okay? Um, yeah, let's get a little life in here, you guys. Uh, <laughs> Wake up. So, Bonnie, you have yes. a really interesting perspective. You helped hundreds of people solve this kind of particular part of the gap. I would love for you to talk a little bit about that, what Investor Circle does, um, who your people are, mm -hmm. and kind of what's the strategy for activating capital here. Absolutely. So Investor Circle's mission is to facilitate the flow of capital into companies that are addressing social and environmental challenges. And so we attract entrepreneurs, we vet them, and we cultivate an investor community and bring them together to facil facilitate the flow of capital. And so our members are individuals, foundations, funds, and family offices all interested in, in being active in this space. And so we see our job is to facilitate those relationships because in the end, what we know, as you've heard, relationships matter in this. And both peer relationships with other investors help people act and getting connected with the entrepreneurs help people act. So we're doing this at local networks in six markets across the country and at national events yesterday where we had the 13 companies present, opportunities for investors to engage with each other as well as the entrepreneurs. Every entrepreneur got an email this morning saying here's the feedback we got from our investors, here's the time for the next due diligence call, let's move this forward. So what's very exciting I think right now is the increasing interest as Julia said from a broader diversity of people wanting to get engaged in early stage investing and when you're experienced in business and such I see those people come in and are ready to go and they just do it and then there's others that that is a little higher hump to get over and so what we are what we aim to do is be by working together with others and creating process to help that happen so this year already we're almost to $10 million invested in 25 enterprises. This year we hit the $200 million mark into companies. Um, so it's, it's constantly about how can we do a better job of helping investors be active and helping entrepreneurs tell their story effectively to the investors for people who are coming into this, whether it's from the financial and, and entrepreneurial space or from a space that's you know, they're less familiar and they need to get comfortable. So I, I love what Investor Circle does. There is a number of really, really interesting and I think new and expanding. You guys are kind of the granddaddies in the space, I think, grandmothers. Um, but there's a number of new organizations which I want to explore at some point. But I want to get into kind of a juicy subject for all of us here. Like if you do this kind of work, you love your underlying investments. You love your entrepreneurs. You love your sort of social enterprises. So um, I, I was hoping that you would, Andy, starting with you, kind of give us um, sort of a highlight investment or two, something fabulous and successful both on you know environmental as well as financial and then possibly a disaster or two like things that just haven't worked out either financially or it didn't create the sort of impact that you wanted just so that people have like eyes wide open if you're new to this field it's very hard to do right this is part of the reason everybody wants to do but it's very very hard to do and it's very hard to do well and so we have example of people um, examples here of people who have done it extremely well but I'd love to you know share a disaster or two as well as some of your great triumphs Yes, yeah, so why don't we go with the positive first? Let's start, start good, on a good news note. first, um, good news first. And so, um, yeah, probably a deal that I am most excited about that's just getting closed at the moment. Um, and the entrepreneur actually is in the room, John from Releve gives a wave. And so, um, Releve is a really interesting company, depends on how you look at it, there's two ways of looking at it, empowers women and girls, former victims of trafficking um, in India who are producing high-end women's jewelry. So really good from an empowering women angle. Um, but that's put off a number of investors because they don't really care about that as their investment thesis. Mm. The other side of it is that it's a really innovative investment structure that we've come up with. So it's a revenue-based payout, it's performance-aligned stock, which means that when the women succeed, um, that they will be paid, and when the women succeed, um, we as investors will be paid as well. And so I was adamant when we went into the process that the women had to own a stake in the company. I wouldn't invest if the women didn't own a stake in the company. Isn't that great? Isn't that how an investor should do it? <laughs> it was one of the most crazy ideas I've come up with, and it was really unhelpful. And so good on Releve, they regrouped with the women and said, what would the consequences be if we gave you this golden opportunity to own a stake in your company? And they told us about how domestic violence may increase, how it would create problems in the home, it would create problems if they were divorced, it would hmm. absolutely be a nightmare. Hmm. And so there was me coming in with a good intention of trying to do the right thing, and therefore we had to spend literally six months dancing around with lawyers to come up with this hmm. innovative structure um, that made that the investors could be happy as well as being empowering of the women. 
Um, so there are different ways of kind of approaching it, but that was all after we'd agreed to make the investment. That was after they'd come and stayed at my home. We had the trust, and we could go backwards and forwards. And even though I was demanding something as an investor, I had to then retreat because it was clearly not going to be in the best interest of anyone involved in the process. Hmm. So it was very much an interactive communication. Um, and one of the things that was interesting with this was bringing in the lawyers and getting the lawyers to work for all of us and to work, more importantly, for the women who were in country. So well, it's also interesting coming up with an, uh, this this demand dividend model, which is relatively, is that what we call it? Performance demand? aligned stock. Performance aligned, sorry, I'm sorry. So it's okay. its looking at creative and new ways, and Bonnie and I were talking about this earlier, like part of the, part of the um, growth of the field, part of the way to get more people involved is to come up with new and creative ways. It can't just be like a private equity stake or just a, a loan, which is what most people are familiar with. I think we have to be more creative, we have to be incentive aligned, and we have to come up with new ways to do that. So I love that you guys are trying to innovate new structures as well. Yeah, and I don't think it's just for the sake of it. I think it's actually trying to listen to the different stakeholders that are involved in it. I think that's often missing. An investor comes in, and these are my terms, these are conditions, and it's a negotiation of percentage numbers mm -hmm. rather than actually saying, what do you really need? Um, another example is a loan deal that we just closed on recently, and the conditions are that women have to be empowered within the organization or else the price of the loan increases. So that's better for the entrepreneur because it means that they can no longer be stuck in this conundrum of whether or not we can afford to hire more women. They have to to be able to get the cheaper, cheaper loan option. So all of the investments that I've done in the last seven years are all still alive and afloat. Um, that's not to say they've all made it, but there's some that keep me up at night and some that get the gray hairs and yeah, and everything else. Um, but there are some that have had some challenges, and lots of that is trying to work through team dynamic issues. Um, and it requires a lot of time and effort mm. post-investment, mm. which is what I think is often missing for these mm -hmm. early stage entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I think investors often don't realize how much time needs to be spent to secure their investment. Right, super helpful. Ron, you have a story mm. or two to share with us? Uh, let's see. I, uh, I'll start with the negative, okay? So, uh, <laughs> So uh, we, we started a business in Haiti um, soon after the earthquake. And I think what we learned there, if this one failed, um, learned there is that we didn't follow our own guidelines, which was really find somebody local to get involved first and then, um, and then go out. But because of the, the rush of the humanitarian issues there and we were bringing in um, uh, housing and school options that would be rapidly assemblable structures. And we actually went down, brought a factory, brought material down there, trained 25 people, um, and then found there was nobody was buying. So even mm -hmm. though there was, I don't know how many billion dollars were down there, even though there was a cholera ep epidemic, um, which these would have been great for isolation wards or that, we didn't get the, we didn't get the market. So we, um, I think it would have survived if we'd started with a, a local hmm. um, manager. Um, we had local people involved in, in the management, but there was outside uh, folks involved that didn't know the, the culture that well. So that how, did, how did you work out that deal? What happened at the end of that investment? Uh, we basically just closed it. We mm -hmm. weren't getting the, the Red Cross only bought it for their own purposes, but not for mm -hmm. the purposes we were designed for. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that was a, that was a failure, um, and it was not following our own guidelines. It was just rushed into it. It's important to do this fast because it was needed. Hmm. Wrong, wrong way to approach it. Um, success, um, most of ours are still very much you know, in process. So in, in India, we, have, we started a business that um, uh, worked for smallholder farmers to try to increase, increase their income. So we've sorted out three or four of the key elements and getting a lot of seller participation, got a lot of dealer participation, a lot of farmer participation, but we're still trying to make it so that they actually have frequency enough for buying so that they can actually benefit of that. But we have roughly 23,000 farmers participating, 8,000 dealers, and um, about 100 sellers. So it's, it's got traction, but it's got the same issues as any startup. So. Um You've been in the field now for a long time, so I'm, I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs come to you directly and or you get referrals from your network. But when you, were, when you and your wife were first starting to make these early stage direct deals, what was your, how did you go about it? What was your, did you go to Opportunity Collaboration? Did you call up Andy? What, how did you look for those deals? We got a lot of referrals. It was from, from, from folks like 
like Andy. So it's um, network still. It's still network, but yeah. there's always more deals than you can consider. Okay. Uh, that's, that deal flow okay. is not an issue. Okay. Well, and I think it comes up with re reputation. So entrepreneurs yeah. ring me and say, which are the top five oh. other investors to, I should be in contact with? And I often tell them the five investors that I'd encourage them not to be in contact with if they're, if they're not prepared to be on a lengthy dance. And I say that they can add value, but I think it's the reputation. And so I'm, I'm referring deals so to Ron all the so time. So you're like an early stage Yelp then. So like, you know, you can, you can leave reviews like this. This investor stinks because they do all this dance around and they don't invest. That's actually kind of cool. There has been a Is that an opportunity? Is that yes. an opportunity for a Yelp based yeah. yes. early stage? Well, it's tricky a little bit because sometimes <laughs> like saying no, because we say no to most of the deals that we look at. And yeah. so, and it's some of its fit reasons. And I mean, there can be a variety of different reasons. A company might not be ready mm -hmm. to talk to us and make, need to make a little bit more progress or um, it just may not be a fit for us. So, but not everyone takes that kindly. So like, so yeah. What oh is gosh. that? I don't know. Sorry, I don't know what that is. It's kind of scary. Yeah. Um, everybody okay? <laughs> do, we need, do we need to stand up and do a little old lady tai chi to calm down? No, everybody's all right. I don't know how to do tai chi. I'm extremely good at old lady tai chi. It's the okay. kind of you know like. <laughs> all right, it calms the nerves. It calms the nerves. Okay, um, Tasha. So. Ron and Andy have done a lot of early stage investing overseas as well, so I'd love for you to kind of take the perspective of you know the work that you do. I don't know if there's a Chicago focus to the entrepreneurs that you invest in. Um, so Chicago focus in that a lot of our entrepreneurs are based in Chicago. That's not, because uh, we started life as an accelerator, and so we were residential, so we had a lot of draw from Chicago. Now we're looking across the US. Um, but I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a story of a company that was Chicago, um, centric with Indian connection, oh, um, where it, it was a, we try to find companies where the impact and the product go hand in hand, and this was a, an example where they became decoupled. So um, there were two co-founders to this company, and they were, uh, one of them had run a school in India, and had observed that a lot of girls drop out when they get to um, uh, puberty. Um, partly because menstruation becomes a big barrier for them, and they miss a lot of school, and they end up dropping out. And so what they were really trying to do is make menstruation a non-issue and provide access to products in rural areas. And so they had this um, business model where they were going to create sort of female entrepreneurs in villages who would carry product and distribute product um, and be able to sort of educate women and girls around the importance and the, and the value of having these products. Uh, and what happened was that they found that, you know, is they could recruit female entrepreneurs, but the education piece wasn't there yet. Hmm. And so um, there was sort of lots of demand for other kinds of product which were not impactful. Uh, and this founding team, I think to their credit, they were very mission focused. And they said, you know what, we need to pull back on this because we don't want to create sort of a distribution product for cosmetics mm. uh, or distribution system. And they um, decided to focus their efforts on the education piece. Huh. So for us, it's a financial write-off, um, but I think it could have great impact in what they're doing. Um, so there's one where it came decoupled. And, but it sounds like an know, opportunity for Avon. Well, right. Um, in fact, they had some mentors from you know that kind of you know, multi-level marketing model. Yeah. It just couldn't get the right product through. Um, uh, a success story. I'll talk about a, a local. Chicago, it's very much Chicago roots. There was a really, really wonderful um, woman who had a uh, background in education. She was a founding teacher at one of the top magnet schools, high schools in Chicago, um, as well as Illinois. She had um, invented a methodology for teaching critical thinking to students. Um, had, had gotten great results with her students. She was workshopping it within Chicago public schools with other teachers. Um, and she came to the conclusion she was never going to have the kind of impact she wanted to doing one workshop at a time. So she came to us and said, I want to build a technology product. Um, and I want to build this methodology into that product. And then I want to sell it to schools because I know schools have money for technology. Um, and they'll spend it where there's real impact. And so we bet on her reputation. Um, we knew we could help her. She, she was a subject matter expert. Um, we could help her find the CTO, build the product. Um, she is now working with over 300,000 students. She's raised funding from um, both financial investors, strategic investors, and the Gates Foundation. She's now been in a position where she's been able to do impact studies, and students that are using the platform are gaining um, 2.2 uh, reading grade levels over the course of one semester. So she's really starting, I think, to fire on all cylinders when it comes to selling the product, showing the impact, um, and, and really getting credibility as a company. I mean, it's early days still, um, but there's a, at least 
burgeoning success story? So, Bonnie, you can either address this question as I put it out there, but as sort of like a, a, a gatherer, a financial intermediary between investors who want to invest and a bunch of social enterprises that are trying to get their message out, um, you can either talk about investments that you've loved before or like the experience that your members have had, like what have been the things that keep your members coming back year in and year out and recommending their friends come to an investor circle to... That's hard to pick between. Can I do both? What's that? Can I do both? You can do That's both. That's hard to pick between. You can do both. Um, there is a... a, a story of an investment I like to talk about because I think it exemplifies, illustrates a lot of what we just heard. Okay. Um, and I spoke yesterday with Gabriel Monduano with Wash Cycle Laundry, a great company out of Philadelphia that received investment first from our Philadelphia local network members. They knew the company. They knew the entrepreneur. They went earlier than a lot of people might have because they knew him. And there was a trust level. They'd worked with him in an accelerator. And they said, this is exciting what he's doing. He's providing inner city laundry service. He started out with large trikes. And you think, how does that work? Think Courier in New York. Getting that letter is a lot more efficient on a bike than a car. Um, and he's doing institutional laundry in, now in Philly and D.C. And is also starting to have... Um, uh, laundry services within institutional client buildings, much more capital efficient, drastic reduction of um, uh, carbon emissions on getting the laundry out there. Um, and another key component of his business model is providing quality, upwardly mobile employment opportunities for employees that are returning citizens. They've had barriers to getting employment, um, uh, whether you know, recidivism issues, et cetera. So exciting company benefited from our local network going early, trust building, and then when he was expanding to Washington, D.C., brought him to our national network. That, those relationships, those, net, those investors knowing their colleagues, trusting this entrepreneur, given those relationships, helped move more capital in. And Can you tell model, us how much capital, Bonnie? Um, I'm not going to say all of that, gosh, because I, I, I might not get it right. Okay. But here's what's important. Um, Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. Really important here, too. His model has shifted over time. He hmm. had aligned investors who provided equity capital early on when debt and other things were not an option. It was the appropriate capital at that time. He has now shifted his model and is positioned for debt. He's now worked with foundations in our network who are interested in his employment model and the opportunities he's creating, and they're providing revenue-based financing with interest, ba interest rates that are related to the jobs. The, the interest goes down when the jobs are created. Right. So I think you know, we heard about the importance of appropriate capital and trust building and knowing um, the entrepreneur and in place. And so I think that's a success story that we're excited about because it's showing the value of network and relationship and trust and having the appropriate types of capital tools. Nice. And that's something we're very excited about bringing. Um, so, you know, what's special about yesterday, and I've heard people tell me this, and the entrepreneurs said this, is this is a special community that they experienced yesterday, which is we are in this together and we're not, um, the entrepreneurs weren't competing with each other in a competition. Everyone is fair game for investment. The investors enjoy seeing these opportunities, seeing each other, and it creates a positive environment for not only investment, but also mentoring and getting feedback to the companies and other connections. And so half of the companies over the past five years that have pitched at our events have received investment, mm -hmm. and there's some that even haven't that have gotten other connections and said, this is really worth it because of the feedback I got today. So this um, environment of collaboration is really important to making this happen and making feel, people feel comfortable to take that step. Nice. Um, I'm going to open this up to questions in a couple of minutes. Um, I have one more question. So the whole purpose of putting this panel together was to help those in the audience, whether you're an investor or a financial intermediary or a social enterprise, sort of get going or dig deeper into this work. And so I'd love it if you guys could share some words of advice, some resources, some lessons that you've learned to get people started, get moving, to expand their work in this space. So I'm sorry I keep on going down the line. This is sort of a bigger panel than I normally organize, and so I feel it's a little clunky, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway, and then when we have questions, you can d direct it specifically to a speaker up here, or they can all address it at, at will. But um, what, what, would you, what would you do for recommendations to get people going, and sorry. resources that you would share? Recommendations for entrepreneurs, I do, I do two, one for entrepreneurs and one for investors. Oh, good idea. Is that allowed? Good um, idea. So recommendation for entrepreneurs is to own your power. Um, you, as entrepreneurs, most entrepreneurs are already motivated, they've got the why nailed down, they're giving their lives to 
this social endeavor that they're involved in. And investors need you a lot, lot more than you need investors. Um, no disrespect to any investors. Um, but generally speaking, the, on, the investors are looking to find their meaning and their worth and are looking to work alongside you. So own that power, even though they have a big checkbook and you're desperate for money. Own the power that you have, and not in a negotiating way, but step into who you can be and be more of who you can be. Um, and then from the investor's angle, I think it's morally outrageous the amount of time and conversation and BS and just nonsense that takes place in the space when investors need their egos to be massaged and need to find their worth in this space and dick around entrepreneurs, mess around entrepreneurs. And, um, and that's bad for the entrepreneur, but it's also bad for the investors that are getting stuff done because you're wasting my entrepreneur's time and I want them to be growing their business, not helping you to find your worth on, on life's journey. So for investors, I really encourage you. I have no problem with you saying yes or no, but just make a decision quickly and be following through on that. And if you make mistakes, be honest about it. We're all making mistakes. We're all trying to figure this one out. The odds are against us as investors in terms of the statistics aren't in our favor for these early stage crazy deals mm -hmm. that we're doing. But we're trying to change the world, and we are trying to deploy capital where our mouth is. So let's think about how we can do that more effectively. Nice. Thank you. Take note, or Andy will come find you. <laughs> <laughs> no messing around. Ron, what do you think? What okay, can we so, do? So for the, uh, for the entrepreneur, uh, um, I would definitely say do due diligence on your investor that you're talking to. And if you find that they, and ask to talk to the people they've funded, if it turns out they haven't funded anyone, then thank them and say, I really don't have time to train you. I really <laughs> don't have to go, time to go through your questions which, and have you go up a learning curve. Um, and I've just today had someone we talked to that told that to at uh, uh, Unreasonable Institute said, we, we actually did that, wasted $200,000 of legal fees, and then we changed it around. We have a great relationship with them now, but we actually moved them into a different, different location. Huh. And, um, um, that they, they walked away from one group, did a great deal with another group. For the investors, um, it's really hard to know what running is like by watching it. Mm. And so, uh, the same thing with impact investing. Probably if I was starting today, uh, what I would do is decide how much I wanted to invest in a, in a given uh, year, say. Um, divide that into fairly small chunks, mm. uh, and then decide to piggyback on people that are spending time at it, recognizing that you know, they may be wrong too, uh, but go in, make your decision in the, within a week, and, and come in and be on six, seven, eight deals a year, and then just learn from, the, yeah. from, the learn from other, doing, really. your fellow investors mm -hmm. and from the entrepreneurs. That's you'll great, learn great so advice. much more, and you'll find out it's not a boogeyman. It's like that we, we fear direct investment. Right. We don't have to. Um, let, me, uh, let me just add a follow-on question. So um, think for the most part in the early stage direct deal investing space, you've had a lot of high net worth individuals. So people who have, you know, let's say 10 million in investable assets that they can carve out, say, you know, 100,000 or a couple hundred thousand dollars. That's kind of the model that you've seen thus far. Typically, they're very passionate about this work and they have the time and the wherewithal to travel around the world and visit with their entrepreneurs. I'm wondering if, and I feel like it is, I feel like the market now for sort of what I would consider sort of average wealth people has expanded. And so um, we were talking earlier about some of the crowdsourcing. I, I think there's more and more opportunity. So I don't know if, if any of you can speak to that. Just like how, how, how are the opportunities for regularly worth wealthy people expanding to, to do early stage direct deals? Well, the deals, the you know, you can get in fairly, in a fairly small amount, but uh, Kiva's uh, now doing SME lending, mm. uh, working capital lending, um, and I think they do $50,000 deals, is what Carlos told me this morning. And um, you can participate at a much smaller basis, but you're actively helping a company get enough working capital to move forward, and that's the biggest, biggest gap. Right. Okay, I want to come back to that, because I think there's a lot to explore, but um, Tasha, do you have any advice for entrepreneurs or for investors about how to get started? Lots of advice for both, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, I mean, I think for investors, what these guys are saying about just you have to be ready to just do it and embrace the risk, build a portfolio. You will learn from that portfolio. Um, angel investing, early stage direct investing is really best done as a team sport. So I think if you find people that have some more experience that you can work with, 
You know, we do that through our fund structure, investor circle, and we're a member of investor circle, by the way. You know, they do it the, through their membership structure. Um, or you could call Andy and sort of see if he'll, you know, make some space for you in some of those investments. But just, you know, find some people that you can work with that see eye to eye and you can learn from um, and just jump into the pool because there's no substitute from actually doing it. Um, and uh, for entrepreneurs, I mean, it can take a long time to raise capital. And I think this, this notion of finding the right investor and looking at the fit and what has this investor done? You know, what have they invested in? Like, are there companies that are like mine but not competitive? Like, do I think that there's um, value that they can bring? Um, and do I think that they'll pull the trigger? It's really important to, to sort of figure out before you waste a lot of time in conversation. Right. So I right. um, recommend that too. Thank you. Yep. Bonnie. They have done a good job of covering a lot of the okay. key points. Entrepreneurs, you know? Okay. Do your due diligence on your investors. I would add one more thing. Don't think of it as like due diligence when they ask questions. This is their money. They want to, you know, it, it's valid to check this out and dig in and learn from it. There's an opportunity here. They're bringing some experience. They need to treat you respectfully. If, if you don't feel respectfully treated, walk away. Just walk away. You don't need to talk to them. Um, that probably isn't good money for you. So, but when they're asking questions, learn from that. Like, Someone else probably will too. You might improve your business model based on that. And investors, yes, jumping in and doing it in a community. If, if you're having a hard time, yep, decide what you're going to do this year. Find a community. Could be Investor Circle. Could be Tonic. Could be Impact Engines Group in Chicago. Um, find a group you're willing to do it. Say we're going to do this together and jump in. Nice, and thank I think you. Community makes Good it all the difference. Mm -hmm. Is there something else you guys wanted to comment on this? Well, I, I don't know what Ron was going to say, but I, I'll say mine, then you can chime in as well. I was going to say about the team sport angle, which I agree with, and I agree about the community angle, but I would just stress a team sport only works when people are all playing. And one of my concerns about this space and where the space is at is the group think mentality, partly because I do get called names when I'm in a group because I'm reckless and I'm foolish, which I find insulting. And also the data doesn't back that fact up. But that's how the group think mentality happens because if somebody's saying, hey, I'm going to back the entrepreneur and I'm going to spend four hours of their time and I'm going to spend four weeks of my time doing my due diligence on them to actually really get into details and not take up their time, there's different ways of approaching it. So it's a team sport and I agree with it, but make sure that you're it's on a team right that's playing. Well, and a team that's actually playing. playing. Got it. And well, Ron, you had some? So I was just going to add that there are other ways um, uh, to make a donation to an organ to a foundation like, like, a, like a DAF, uh, you mean, or? Pardon me? Through a DAF, you mean, or? Uh, no. Uh, so John Aliff, who's sitting right there, um, has started something called uh, Gift Vest. So if you're not wanting to play yet, but are wanting to learn, you can make a donation to participate in a learning community uh, that happens to be, um, you know, around around the U.S., around um, around Europe, and um, you know, small donations, relatively small donations, uh, can be put to work as an investment, and you're learning about the. So the that's Gift Vest. It's gift called. Gift Vest. I know Impact Assets also has a sort of seed platform where you can. You know, you put fifty thousand dollars into your donor advised fund, and then you can actually start investing in um, social enterprises that they're finding through a village capital network. So there are a bunch of different opportunities like that as well. So we have about twenty odd minutes left for this panel. I would love to open this up to the audience. I want to make this relevant. Oh, look, we have people asking questions. I'm so happy. I almost thought I was going to have to plant, but I don't, sir. Uh, my name is Kyle. Oh, hey, hey, hey. Hi. Um, my name is Kyle Westaway, and one of the hats that I wear is as a lawyer for social entrepreneurs, and we do a lot of early stage deals. So I would love to hear from the panel from the investor side. Um, how can lawyers make, how can my profession make your job or make the deals flow easier? Oh my God, did you guys hear that? That's a lawyer asking, <laughs> how can they be helpful to the field? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Showing up business. <laughs> um, Thoughts? I will jump in if, yes. you, if you're not going to. No, you, you jump always in. get to go first. Oh, it seems so take unfair. Take the power. Take okay. the power. Um, it's a, it's you know, I, I, you know, my viewpoint is like at the early stages, there's very standard sets of terms and structures, and just if you put something in place, clean, vanilla, fair to all parties, it's you know easy for you know to, to understand, no gotchas. Like to me, that's the cleanest, simplest way. If the company's successful then you know, they'll raise follow-on capital. Cleaner structure helps, and you'll get more business. So I mean, I, I'm a big believer in simple, clean market you know, yeah. as the, yeah. please. Uh, I'm an attorney as well, so, um, and I hate long contracts. So I would, first of all, tell your, the parties to work out the deal 
that they would shake hands on. Turn that over to you rather than saying you guys, you make the deal. And you'll, it'll be much faster and much cheaper for them and you'll be the hero. I also, oh, I'm sorry, if I can just comment also, um, I have somebody speaking on a panel with me tomorrow, Jenny Kasson, I don't know if you know her, but she's been doing, n not only that, I think trying to simplify it and standardize so it's, it's cheaper and more um, understandable for most people, but um, she's also trying to create new ways, like structure things so that they're innovative and, and creative and, and building those legal structures. So I'd love to see that. I'm sorry, did you have I was going to say, there's, there's one group that has 30,000 pro bono lawyers that are looking for work, which isn't probably helpful for Kyle, but I will say <laughs> it for everyone else, uh, and that's called A, and then number four, ID.org, Advocates for International Development. So if you're an entrepreneur, I've used them and I've had hundreds of thousands of free legal fees um, paid for by their pro bono su supplying. Um, but the big thing that I do is I often negotiate against my lawyer. So I'm a non-practicing barrister as well. Um, and so I negotiate against my lawyer in terms of what legally do I have to do to make sure we're not going to jail? And then what is your advice? And then we can discuss if that is actually what we want to present to the entrepreneur. And lawyers often have to represent the clients and say, you must get this, and I have to clarify, do I legally have to have that, or is that just your advice? Mm. So if lawyers can actually listen and try to present the options, because it's different if we're negotiating together, we're not trying to be adversarial, and that's often missing. Hope that's helpful. Um, what else? I saw a question over here. Yes, sir. Oh, hi. Um, can you talk a little bit about these more innovative deal structures um, beyond just sort of straight debt, straight equity? Yeah. Our company is just getting started at impact investing, and oh, I'd love to hear some kind of concrete examples of, of structures that Can you, you guys have used. This, oh, Ron's going to start this conversation? Good. Okay, unless you want to. No, go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, we, um, we got involved with debt because we, in many cases, didn't see an exit uh, with a standard convertible debt uh, equity situation, and um, we felt that was the biggest need. But People kept asking us, well, what about something that is equity-like? And we kept saying, you don't have an exit. You don't, we're not going you know, to go into that standard approach because I don't want to be arguing with you seven years from now as to how to get out. So we, we did two things. One is uh, I spent many years as a publisher, wrote tens of thousands of royalty checks, um, and realized that that was a very easy way to, to monitor, to do, you, know, to, you don't have arguments about uh, top-line revenue, which is auditable. Uh, you have a lot of arguments about uh, do I have, is that money that's set aside for potential expansion going to be used and grabbed by the, 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 um, by the investors because it's a demand dividend. Didn't like that model. So uh, we just expanded the short term, 12, 6 to 24 month ones, and um, where, it was a, where it was paid back at, in proportion to the revenue. Um, we just expanded that to the longer one and it became combination of the royalty model from publishing and the, you know, the revenue uh, synced uh, expansion. And there's been a lot of work. Uh, John uh, did, did quite a bit. Uh, Mark, if you're, I think you're here somewhere. Um, a lot of work that's been done to make it work in the U.S. Um, as well. But it essentially is what Andy was talking about, is, is performance-aligned uh, payments. Is John, John Kohler, are you here in the audience? Is that what you're referring John, to? So we're John about, Berger. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's the approach that we did with John Berger from Releve, oh. and that's been this one that we've oh, taken oh, oh. a long time I with see. the lawyers. And that's okay. somewhat complex, but isn't that difficult. It's all legally tight. You just need to understand the, the terms of it. The other option is to kind of keep it simple and just have clauses that you add in and keep it simple where you're getting a percentage of revenue straight off the top, and it's a working capital loan. And that's often what entrepreneurs need, even though they're being influenced in other directions. So happy to have an offline conversation to dive into the details. And I'll chime in. There's a Google Impact Terms Project that's looking to create a bit of a clearinghouse of term sheets and such that people have used using these tools. And some of our, we have a couple, few of our members that this is the only way they structure deals. And we had, what, four uh, workshops this year at our local networks all focusing on this. So there's a lot more interest in understanding. We're trying to grow that with investors so this to be more familiar. Yeah. Impact Terms Project. Yeah, we, we, we share the, the work that was done. Um, and also Blue Dot is having a session here, maybe already had it. Um, also the same kind of thing, but a lot of, models that you can just pick up, study, decide whether it works for you, and then go down the line of not having to reinvent the term sheets. What else? Right here. Hi, I'm Julie Abrams. I have my own uh, consulting practice, Impact Investing Analytics, and I'm a consultant to Impact Us, which is a soon to launch online impact investing marketplace, which is a FINRA broker dealer, registered in 50 states and a bunch of territories. Um, my question is two, two questions. Um, 
Ron and Angie, I'm very curious to, if you can expand on your four-hour due diligence, <laughs> and what that looks like. And then Bonnie or any of you, um, is it presumed that you must always maintain and continue and have a relationship on an ongoing basis for these early stage investments oh. versus an investor who wants to invest and then be a bit more hands off. Oh, Thanks. Interesting. Good questions. You guys go for it. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, so I'll chime in on that. So, um, what was the, oh, the one for me was about the long term relationship. So, I think this is exciting because I think there's a huge opportunity here. Relationship is key for these investments, and these entrepreneurs need more. And I'll, here's another recommendation for entrepreneurs, expect more than just the money. Um, with your early stage investors, look for connections and expertise in the industry. So one thing, again, valuable about a network is you can have people there that, who have that experience and can engage on the board and be an advisor. But I think there's a huge opportunity for us that we're seeing, and I'm having a lot of conversations now with advisors and such about how to aggregate more capital and creating opportunities for the people that want to do this but don't have the time to give, but really want to support this. Because it can be time consuming if you do it well. And so we have in existence the Patient Capital Collaborative series of funds that creates that opportunity for our members and beyond to invest in deals done by our network um, and be a part of that fund and, and learn from being engaging in that fund. And we're looking at some platform opportunities and even some DAF opportunities where we could aggregate additional capital into the deals we do at those same terms. and get more money into the entrepreneur. So, in fact, yeah, we're, we're talking to you. Well, and if I can just comment that really quickly, that's one of the things that I've been thinking about because we have a number of clients who want to look at early stage, really catalytic um, investments, but they typically either don't have the expertise or the time to kind of do the follow on. And so one of the things I've been thinking about is um, drawing upon our partners and our network. And so if we co-invest with um, a group that's dedicated to that particular field, that and then they have a board seat, for example, then we can take advantage of their ongoing relationship and get kind of like a, a quarterly or a semi-annual report on that. Because I think you do. I think in an early stage investment, you have to continue to the relationship, but you have to gauge it towards what kind of time and resources that you have. So that's one way that we're trying to address it is it's, it's still building a network, it's still having people together, but it's kind of networking on those that do it professionally and trying to make that work um, for them. Do you guys want to address the earlier question about Yeah, methodology? Which, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. the four-hour due diligence, yeah. which I yeah. love, yes. Uh, that's the meat. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is something that uh, we do quite a bit, and a lot of it is based on the fact that we have uh, many years of experience, my wife and I, and, and working with lots of different businesses. But we were asked to, you know, say, what is our intuition? Because we'd say, it's, I always say it's about how do I feel about the, the deal? And um, if I don't feel right about it, I won't, we won't do it. But I'm looking for a reason to say yes. So I'm, I'm looking for things to disqualify it in a minor way, and then I can go to the quick, second best answer, which is no, um, and do it quickly. But the uh, intuition, I'd, I'd break it down into, does the intervention make sense to me? Um, and I can get that feeling, I, and I'm not going to get down to the details and does that work and so forth, but I've got to get a feeling that they have a successful intervention. Does the business model make sense? And I usually ask about gross margin and changes in the gross margin, just to hear how they talk about it. Because hmm. if they don't know about it, then if I'm, that's a warning sign. Um, if they do know about it and can actually talk about what's going to happen in that way, then I know they have some better understanding of the finances. Uh, the third one is it's scalable, because most of what I get into is uh, I'm not into starfish, I'm into, you know, how do we make this? I believe what Paul, Pollock said is a million people, $3 million of capital, can we make it happen? Hmm. It's got to be scalable. Fourth one uh, would be does the team talk to each other and listen to each other? Uh, the, you know, does the entrepreneur hog all the discussion, or do I do I hear them talking with each other and do mm. they listen to each other? Because that's how they're going to listen to us, or not. And then the fourth, the fifth one rather, is the um, how have they dealt with adversity? Can they explain what happened, what, how they found out about it, what they did about it, and maybe pivoted or maybe just adjusted their model? Hmm. Do you want me to give a quick live example? Yeah. So I spoke to an entrepreneur last week. Um, they referred to me by three different people, which was interesting because they're obviously on the radar of the people that are passing them on to me. We had an hour long conversation um, and he passed the first screen. I trust him. Um, I like what he's trying to do. And I wouldn't mind having it on my obituary because it's quite a cool business idea that he's going to do. So that's the first screen. So I'm excited to learn more. I've then given him a list, a three page list of all the documents that I'd like to have if he has them. And I've told him I expect him to have only 20% of them, if that, and not to write anything specifically for me, but just to dump it. Um, so that's the next stage that I'm waiting to hear back from him with that. I will then work through those documents. We'll have a call next week, and I'll 
see if I'm checking in with him again to see if it's still as good as it felt last week. Um, and if it is, then we'll start proceeding to actually start, start discussing term sheets and how we'd be structuring it, and then work to see if we can get it closed within seven more weeks. So the idea is to do four hours of his time. It's going to be a chunk of my time to do the due diligence. Um, and then it's spending the time after the investment that secures it. How much time will I be spending? So I will, I will limit myself to be done within eight weeks. So it's not, it's not going to be done within a week. I deliberately want to sleep on it, come here, think about it, reflect on it. So I give myself that time to do it. Um, and then in terms of the hours, I think it will depend on how how uh, savvy he is and the information he's given, and also how open he is in the conversations that we're having. How important is it to you or to Ron or to Tasha, anybody really, about who else is investing? That is to say, is it helpful to know who else is investing and have good faith in them, or d is that not part of your decision-making process? Best deal I've done, aside from the one that's about to be done with Releve, um, we were the only ones that put money in. Mm. Um, and that was brilliant. Um, most risky deal is a deal that we're the only ones to put money in. Mm. So um, it can go both, both, right. go both extremes. Right. Um, I'm not, I don't follow the crowd, but I do make sure, because I'm managing other people's money, mm. I don't want them to be suing me, and right. I want to make sure that I have due diligence and I have thought through the different options so that if it goes wrong in a year's time, I can justify the decision-making process. It. So it is important to know who else is doing it, but. I think the whole hand-holding before we get in, somebody needs to jump in the pool, right? So we're going to be right. holding hands forever. Right. Mm. I, yeah, I mean, I would just sort of add on top of that. There's another reason. Like, part of it is, um, like, how expertise we have and who else there has complementary expertise to support right. the company. And are these people that I think are going to behave rationally when things maybe don't go according to plan? Uh, because that's really, I mean, that is really yeah. important. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing I can tell you for sure when I look at any entrepreneur's plan is that it is incorrect and it will be different maybe in three months, maybe in a year, but right. it will be different at some point. And right. so understanding you know, the investor group and, and, and having trust and building okay. trust is valuable. Nice. Do I have other questions in the audience? Oh, oh back here. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Lisa Van Dusen from SV2, Silicon Valley Social Venture Fund. Hi, Lisa. Hello. Um, and I uh, was hoping, a lot of you talked about the team sport aspect of doing this, and SV2 is a community where people come together, some very new to impact investing and some not so new. And I would love it if you could talk a little bit more about the kind of the perils and the positives of that, and particularly um, from the lens of doing this as an impact first or doing it from a philanthropic fund, because we, we invest through a DAF, the Impact Assets DAF. So if you could just talk a little bit more about that. Um, and if you were to drill into one thing, it would probably be how you, how you look at impact, how you evaluate that as a group. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that question. And, and before you guys dive into that, I would love to just throw out some of these membership organizations for those of you who are thinking about this and think it might be helpful. I don't have a complete list, but I kind of was thinking about it before we, we got here together. But um, So there are obviously Investor Circle. You've heard about it. You can take a look. They've got a bunch of stuff going on, so you can check them out. Tonic. Um, is another group, T-O-N-I-I-C. They actually have on their website a really great e-guide. It's an early stage e-guide. If you're new to this field and you want to get sort of a lay of the land and a landscape, take a look at that guide. It's really, really excellent. Um, there's Opportunity Collaboration, actually, um, which is a group that gets together and they, they go off-site to Mexico and they spend a, ton, a lot of time trying to get people together to solve problems and figure things out. Um, Prime Coalition, I think, is relatively new, very, very focused on climate change, clean energy solutions. Um, Renew, strate Renew Strategic, Jody? Sorry? Strategies. Renew Strategies, which is, um, at the moment at least, very focused on Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, if you're interested in that, Jody sits on their, on their advisory board or something. Jody Morris, you can ask her about that. CREO, which is a group of family offices that are looking for renewable energy, um, al alternative investments for um, clean energy and climate change. Um, Village Capital and Vilcap Communities is super interesting. They're doing some really, really interesting work about early stage deals and looking for cohorts. They've got an interesting model. Are there other ones that are um, out there that you guys can think of that I've missed? Pim Wimmick. Huh? Pim Wimmick in Europe. Ah, Pim Wimmick, that's right. I didn't address Europe. So Pim Wimmick in Europe. There's um, also Clearly So, I think, in the UK is another mm -hmm. group that's like that. So anyway, we can get more resources, but there's a lot going on. A lot of it's happened in the last couple of years. I'll chime okay. in on Pipeline Angels as well. Oh, um, focus right. on getting more women investors engaged right. and doing impact deals. And, and the whole model of is training you, and you pledge your money up front, and at the end of the training, a deal is done. Very cool. So back to Lisa's question about pros and cons of, of team sport. 
So I was going to say that that's great to have that list of names. I think there's a lot of good players that are playing really well in that list. Um, I think there's another way to potentially do stuff as well, which is kind of piggybacking, like Ron had said, with people that are getting stuff. And so when we said about um, who else is investing and how important that is, um, I think it's really important that the entrepreneurs are going to need more money beyond the money that we're investing in, so we need to find ways to collaborate with other people. Right. And one of the things that we've, the analogy that we've used is, you know, we're doing a four by four relay, and we're feeling that we're coming towards the end of the first lap. Who mm. else is going to be putting more money in? Mm. And there's some people that are tripping me up, telling me that there wasn't a good running race so far. There's some people that are coaching me, telling me how good it is that they're running, but they're not actually running. And we're looking for people that we can be piggybacking with. And so Ron had said about if he was to do it again, where he would be starting now, there's an awful lot of people that are getting stuff done, that if you can make that personal connection with the people that are doing stuff, that secures your investment to follow on. Anybody else have thoughts on pros and cons of collaborative work? Yeah, if it slows it down, I, I, I thought you meant more the team sport being I'm in a team with the entrepreneur. Ah, And uh, that so that's too. really, way, yeah. yeah, I think you did mean that. Uh, but uh, the, the risks of being a team sport with investors, it, it can slow things down. I, I prefer to have a learning community okay. that is looking into something, but a small group that's work actually moving it forward in a timely fashion. Uh, and you learn together rather than let's all discuss, you know, this, let's have 20 people discuss this thing and see who can be the smartest person in the room to right. stump the entrepreneur. That's not a great team. Not I think I mean, that's SV2 model, really. It's, it's a learning community. You guys get together, you share ideas, and then you've been making investments together, right? That's been the model. And I want to give a shout out, because they did exactly what I was describing. Right. They made a commitment deciding to do this, pulled the money, said, let's do it, let's get it done, engage with the community, you know, with, with IC and others to get some deals done. So actually, I think you're on the right track. And I Yay. think the other important thing here that I want to stress, which maybe yeah. is slightly off topic, but very relevant, is that the, the understanding you bring on the impact side and with these issues coming from a philanthropic perspective is a very valuable one to have at the table in understanding, does this entrepreneur have a real solution here? Because there could be cases where someone who's coming at it purely from the business side doesn't understand the real issue at stake. Mm -hmm. And having those voices there to say, hey, this is on it, or actually this does not address the core issue is something good to know. So kudos for jumping in. And I just don't want to jump in on the impact Okay, because we have three minutes and 45 seconds Can left. Can we talk Tasha. about the impact? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. the impact. It is impact. Yeah. 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 Utilize it. Go on, yeah, okay, okay. Let's talk about the impact. Come on. I, I mean, I think the way that we approach it is having an impact thesis, but then validating the impact thesis. So not every organization we invest in has proof, but we have to have a belief, either because it's research-driven or because we are talking to experts in the field, that the intervention or the sort of what whatever they're doing is going to have an impact and that one day it will be like measurable or proxyable or something along those lines. So I think that's really important not to lose in the investment side of things, that that impact link and validating that is an important part of the, the investment sort of thesis yeah. and decision process. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one quick question and one quick response. Does anybody have a burning question that must be asked? Yes, sir. Uh, the word transparency has been batted around at several prior sessions. Transparency at the operating level of the, of the companies themselves. And there's been some surveys done about the link between startups, both impact and not, that uh, embrace transparency and eventually better performing startups and seeing if there is actual a link there. Do you have any thoughts or comments or observations from your experience of seeing a correlation between entrepreneurs that embrace transparency and do want to engage their external audience and eventually better performing startups? I mean, would you invest in a company that wasn't transparent? I guess you need to define that first. Right, so, yeah. You know. Okay. Why? I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go on, go on. Well, I was going to say, I mean, I think a lot of, in the early days, transparency with the entrepreneur is not so much about numbers or performance. It's really about sort of what their struggles are and where they need help. And so I think that a lot of that comes down to relationship and trust. And that's why that sort of team sport with the entrepreneur is really important. Um, but I do think entrepreneurs that are really clear with the investors that are trusted partners around, like, here's where I'm struggling, here's where I need help. Um, I think those companies end up doing better because they get the right resources and advice around that. That's a good point. Anything else you guys want to add quickly? Well, I think transparency is the key, and if there isn't transparency, wouldn't invest. I've walked away from a deal at 11th hour because I didn't feel good about it and what the entrepreneur was doing. Um, and I'm actually upping my transparency de demands requirements. Um, but with that means that I've got to make sure I don't put the entrepreneur in a position where they have to lie to me. Hmm. And I think that's what investors do. You know, they, they ask too many questions. The entrepreneur, of course, the entrepreneur is going to lie to you. You're, you're, you're wanting to get growth numbers that the entrepreneur doesn't believe in. They're going to make them up just to get the money. 
And so I think it is getting that trust relationship, but I also think it's changing it. Like, that's the reason I get them to come to my home, read bedtime stories to my kids, because it changes the power dynamic, because they get to know me as a real person who's trying to work alongside them, and we can actually build the business together. Um, thank you all so much for joining us late in the day here. Um, if you could join me in a round of applause for our speakers today. Um, thank you guys so much. I hope this was helpful. I hope some of you go out and start studying and doing um, early stage direct deals. And thank you. Enjoy the rest of the